Yeah, and what I what I sort of gleaned from the from the records is so what would happen with this phone is it would sort of check in with the tower. You get a new tower on the on the record when it would check in with a new tower. So that last check in, it sat on that tower for days. It just checked in with that tower for for days before you you know in my mind the battery. Died. Yeah, I drove out there. After hearing Stephen Jackson explain how Stephen Kosher's phone pinged off the 515 and Russell Road cell tower for days before the battery died. I couldn't shake the thought that Stephen's phone could possibly still be sitting out there in that area all these years later. Sure, the odds that someone hadn't picked up Stephen's phone over the last 11 years is very slim, and the odds that it hasn't been buried in the dirt or under rocks is slim as well. And even if the phone is discovered, the odds that the phone will be undamaged is even more slim. However, if the phone is recovered and data from the phone could be retrieved, it could easily solve this case. Stephen was texting and receiving texts from several people in the last week before he disappeared. From December 7, 2009 to December 11, 2009, Stephen received 19 text messages and he sent out nine text messages. In that last week, Stephen received text messages from his boss, Travis, at the window washing business, his landlord, Brett Bishop, his church president, Greg Webb, a friend of Stephen's named Tommy, and Stephen's dad, Rolf. I'll talk more about Stephen's friend, Tommy, later in this video. Additionally, after Stephen was last seen on surveillance footage on December 13th at noon on Evening Light Street, he received text messages from his boss, Travis, and from his landlord, Brett Bishop, that same evening. He also received multiple texts in the days shortly after his disappearance, once again from Travis, as well as from Brett Bishop. What were these text messages about? Since no documents were found in Stephen's car or in his bedroom in St. George, and no emails or online website visits were found that might explain his behavior in the days leading up to his disappearance, this leaves only a few options to help us explain his behavior. Either Stephen met with someone in person and received instructions, Stephen was receiving instructions via text message, or a combination of the two. This is why it is so imperative that we at least try to recover Stephen's phone, regardless of the slim odds. Another possibility that I considered is that Stephen's phone was tossed into the trash there at the U-Haul moving and storage facility. But you would think if his phone was still receiving phone calls and texts, there would be chimes and vibrations emanating from the phone that might have alerted someone to its location. I contacted the U-Haul moving and storage located at 1098 Stephanie Place, and I asked them what their trash days are. They stated that due to the overwhelming amount of trash they receive throughout the day, they have their trash picked up daily. Therefore, it's not probable that Stephen's phone was tossed into the dumpster or a trash can there at the facility, because it would have been moved from that area over the span of a few days. One thing I want to note is that this isn't just a U-Haul rental store, but also a storage unit facility. If someone that did harm to Stephen owned a storage unit at this facility, there is a possibility that Stephen's phone was tossed into their storage unit on December 14, 2009. This might explain why Stephen's phone remained in this area for days, pinging off the nearby tower before the battery died out. Another thing I've been doing over the last few months is going through eBay listings weekly, looking for the same cell phone type that Stephen had. If I find one that matches, I check to see where the phone is being sold from. If it's being sold from Nevada, Utah, or California, I contact the seller. Thus far, no luck. Even though the odds are slim to none that Stephen's phone is still in this area near the 515 and Russell Road Tower, it still has to be looked into. To my knowledge, in the over 11 years since Stephen's disappearance, no one has ever gone out to this area to look for Stephen's phone. That's why I feel I have to go out to this area and take a look if for no other reason than to just check this off my list and say, hey, at least I tried. In my quest to discover what happened to Stephen Kosher, I have to leave no stone unturned. On Friday, June 25th, I returned to Henderson, Nevada, to the area where Stephen's phone last pinged. I arrived early in the morning and I hope to search most of this area inside this yellow rectangle before it became too hot. Given that the neighbor Judy Lee saw a U-Haul truck pull up to the DiMaggio's house on December 13, 2009 in the afternoon, and that Stephen's phone last pinged near this U-Haul moving and storage facility, it's certainly possible that Stephen's phone was tossed out in the area surrounding this U-Haul moving and storage facility. 
this is the area that I wanted to focus on first thing. I decided to start my search checking along the edges of the vacant lot that is adjacent to the U-Haul moving and storage. I began my search moving north along Stephanie Place towards the northwest corner of the lot. This is a Google image of the northwest corner of the vacant lot taken back in 2011. As you can see in this updated image, very little has changed over the last 11 years. As I began searching this ditch in the northwest corner, I immediately realized that this was going to be a more strenuous task than I had originally imagined. The ditch area in this northwest corner of the vacant lot is covered with trash and tumbleweeds. It is unreal the amount of trash and tumbleweeds that have accumulated in this corner over the years. Without a rake, shovel, garden tools, and trash bags, the task of searching for Stephen's phone under all of this debris is going to be next to impossible. Because of all this debris, I opted to just do a preliminary surface level search of this area. I did this by kicking the trash and tumbleweeds out of the way to see if the phone could be seen resting on the surface underneath the trash and tumbleweeds. Off camera, I did get down on my hands and knees and closely examine the area underneath the debris before moving on. It's just a never ending pile of trash out here. It's right next to a gas station, an AM, PM. So a lot of the trash that blows over from there ends up over here. I mean, it could be anywhere in here. I was planning on going around the edges of this vacant lot in a clockwise direction. However, I was approached and followed by a homeless man who started kicking over tumbleweeds and trash, mimicking what I was doing while grunting and coughing. To avoid a confrontation, I decided to move the search south along Stephanie Place and then move east behind the U-Haul moving and storage facility. Looking at Google images of this corner of the vacant lot back in 2011 and comparing it to what this corner of the lot looks like now, it doesn't appear that much has changed over time. All right, so I found this. I doubt this is a cell phone like back cover, but I'm just gonna take it and compare it with the uh, photos of, of what Steven's cell phone uh, you know, looked like, the, the model and everything. You know, I've seen a few things that give me some hope that maybe his phone could still be laying out here. Objects that look like they've been here for a long time and they, they're laying on the top layers of the ground. It was rather easy to do a quick search of this area as there is very little trash and tumbleweeds to contend with. I then moved my search to the southwest corner just outside of the vacant lot near the fence that is adjacent to the 515 interstate. Comparing this Google image of this location back in 2011 to present day, we can see that there have been some changes in this area over time. Over the years, they've dumped these rocks in here. They look fairly new. So his cell phone was down there. It's covered. In checking Google images, I discovered that the rocks were poured into this area after 2018. After checking this area, I then moved southeast along the fence line between the 515 interstate and the U-Haul moving and storage facility. Comparing a Google image of this area from 2011 to present day, we can see the rocks that have been added. If Stephen's phone was tossed out in this area, it would now be buried under these rocks. There was a small area near the Stephanie Street overpass where rocks had not been poured and there was a collection of trash piled up. Since I did not have the proper equipment to sift through the piles of trash, this will be a place I will come back and check out on a future trip when I have the proper equipment. Next, I climbed the slope up to Stephanie Street and moved north alongside Stephanie Street. In looking at Google images of this area from 2007, we can see that quite a bit has changed. This narrow crosswalk was created around 2016, so there was no chance of Stephen's phone being up here. 
I moved back down the slope and searched the slope as I moved north. If they had found Steven's cell phone, they probably, you know, back in 2010, 2011, they probably would have taken it to a pawn shop or something like that and gotten some bucks for it. More than likely, if someone did pick it up, they just have it in a junk drawer somewhere. It's good that I'm doing this kind of like as a preliminary search for if someone else or a group of people do come back out, they can at least skip over some of what I've done already and kind of get down to the nitty gritty. I then proceeded to move west alongside Russell Road to complete my parameter search of the area surrounding the U-Haul moving and storage facility. As I moved back into the ditch areas of this vacant lot, I once again encountered the large piles of trash, tumbleweeds, as well as some shrubbery. Once I had completed searching the edges, I moved into the center of the vacant lot, thus completing a search of the area surrounding the U-Haul moving and storage facility. I found a crispy, crispy dollar. Yeah, I'd much rather it be Steven's phone, but I'll take the dollar. Next, I moved the search east across Stephanie Street and moved south along the westernmost edge of the Russell Road Recreation Complex. Looking back at Google images of this area from 2011, we can see that there have been some drastic changes to the landscape here. They added these rocks next to the Russell Road Recreation Complex sometime between May 2016 and early 2018. This building was not here back in 2010. It wasn't until 2016 when they began construction in this area. After over four hours in the Nevada sun, the 100 plus degree heat started getting the better of me and I decided to call it a day. While I had searched most of the area that I had wanted, there remains this area that I still need to search, which I hope to do on another trip. While I came home empty handed, I do feel satisfied in knowing that I at least tried. Moreover, I feel I have set myself up for success on a future date when I go back out to this area to perform a more rigorous search. In keeping with the theme of leaving no stone unturned, I wanted to give you all kind of a behind the scenes glimpse of some of the people that I have been contacting over the last six months 
regarding Stephen Kosher's disappearance. Some of these people I've already mentioned in previous videos, some I haven't. There are many people who I've contacted over the last six months regarding Stephen's disappearance that are not going to show up on this list. I simply don't feel comfortable revealing that information to you all at this time. Most of you will recall that I did speak with Stephen's boss, Travis Hansen, early on. Travis was extremely friendly and forthcoming with information about his dealings with Stephen. Travis had a rational explanation for the multiple text messages and calls between him and Stephen in the last week before Stephen disappeared. Just as a refresher, Travis stated that he 100% does not have any business dealings in Nevada, never has. And while flyers for Travis's window washing business were found in Stephen's car, Travis assured me that these were flyers that Stephen would have been handing out in the St. George area only. To back this statement up, we have witnesses who came forward after Stephen went missing who stated that Stephen was seen handing out flyers in their neighborhood in St. George. And we also have witness testimony from the two girls that Stephen helped who were locked out of their house in the St. George area. Moreover, no one has ever come forward and stated that they saw Stephen handing out flyers in that Henderson neighborhood where Stephen went missing. Next is Corey Dwayne Drumright. Corey's car was seen on Evening Light Street, parked near the DiMaggio's house, around the time of Stephen's disappearance. Corey was quite friendly and forthcoming with information about why he was there on Evening Lights around the time of Stephen's disappearance. Corey had never heard of Mark DiMaggio or Brett Bishop, and when shown pictures of the two, he stated that he had never seen them before in his life. I still find it odd that in the 11 years since Stephen disappeared, not a single person had ever contacted Corey prior to me contacting him. Next is Stephen's neighbor, John, who lived just across the street from Stephen in St. George, who claimed he saw Stephen leave late at night on December 12, 2009. John's story about what he saw that night has not changed over the last 11 years. I absolutely believe that John did see Stephen leave that night. But remember, John told me he did not speak with Stephen that night. In fact, he stated that Stephen kept to himself and didn't really talk to any of the neighbors. Next are Greg Webb and Seth Abode. I've lumped these two together because they were both friends of Stephen from the church he attended, and they were both the last to speak with Stephen on the phone prior to his disappearance. I contacted both of them early on, and I never received a response. I attempted again recently, and once again, I have not received a response. If Greg and Seth happen to be watching this video, please contact me at aaronstoner at yahoo.com. I would love to interview you both for my channel. If you don't want to be on my channel, I would still love to talk to you. Next on the list is Judy Lee, the neighbor who lived directly across the street from the DiMaggio's at 2261 Evening Light Street. Judy Lee gave all the information about what she saw on December 13, 2009 to the Kosher's private detective. Some of what Judy saw that day can be viewed in the Henderson Police Report that was released in 2020. Judy didn't want to be on my channel even though I offered to donate to her favorite charity. Next on the list are Mark Patey and Ranch Pratt. These were the co-owners of the 4Care Pharmacy where Brett Bishop was employed. I reached out to both these gentlemen early on back in January of this year. Neither one has ever responded. I attempted to get a hold of Ranch again a few months ago, and I spoke with Mr. Pratt's assistant at one of his current companies, Indigo Industries. His assistant assured me that Ranch would love to help any way he could on a missing persons case, but I did not receive a response. The questions I asked Mark and Ranch were quite simple and shouldn't have taken them more than a few minutes to answer. I understand that these two are extremely busy, given that they are serial entrepreneurs, but all I'm asking is for a few minutes of their time to answer some very basic questions. Based upon some information I have received via a tip, I genuinely believe that Mark and Ranch have information that could help shed more light on this case. I am in no way whatsoever implying that they were involved in Stephen's disappearance, but they could possibly connect some dots. I reached out to Mark DiMaggio's ex-girlfriend back in January, and I never received a response. However, recently someone claiming to be her took to Reddit and started posting. I messaged this person directly on Reddit, but as of the making of this video, they did not respond. If you are listening, I would love to interview you for my channel. Please contact me at aaronstoner at yahoo.com. If you want to remain completely anonymous and just give me some information, you absolutely can. Now before we get into these posts made by this person, I want all of you to understand that we do not know that this is Mark DiMaggio's ex-girlfriend. However, they do seem to know things about Mark that no one else other than someone close to Mark would know. 
In my first Stephen Kosher video, I mentioned quite vaguely that I had discovered Mark had some prior run-ins with the law, dealing with drugs and violence. I could not reveal that information in detail because it hasn't been made public. But here in this person's second Reddit post, they basically put it out there for the whole world to see. DiMaggio has been running from law in some way for over 20 years. Drug charges and jail time in addition to DV. The DV here stands for domestic violence. That's precisely what I had discovered about Mark back in December 2020. Another person I have spoken with is the security director for Penske Auto Group back in 2005. Penske Auto Group oversees all the various high-end car dealerships that are in this one area in Scottsdale, Arizona. The Porsche dealership located at 18,000 North Scottsdale Road, which is part of the Penske Auto Group, is where Brett's stolen silver Porsche Cayenne was taken from. The security director was surprised to hear from me. He told me that he stopped working at the dealership shortly after the Porsche was stolen to become a police officer. I talked to him for a bit and he recalled the Porsche being taken, but he couldn't recall all the details about the car theft. He couldn't recall the details because so much time has passed and there were multiple car thefts back in 2004 and 2005 from multiple dealerships under the umbrella of the Penske Auto Group. He told me that he believes there were some guys working in the valet and or auto detailing that were helping to steal these cars, but they were never able to prove anything. He told me that he had never heard of or seen Brett Bishop or Mark DiMaggio. He referred me to the new security director at the dealership and gave me her phone number. I spoke with her and gave her the VIN number for the stolen Porsche. Additionally, I gave her the VIN number that had been stuck to the top of the real VIN number to conceal that the vehicle had been stolen. When a car thief steals a vehicle, they will take the VIN number from a vehicle of the same make and model and place it over the stolen VIN number. This is called VIN cloning. Brett's clone VIN number came back to a 2004 aluminum slash silver Porsche Cayenne. The only difference is that Brett's Porsche was a 2005. This clone 2004 Porsche was first titled in Ohio in 2006, and the owner has since moved to Florida. I find it odd that this 2004 Porsche Cayenne didn't get titled until 2006 in Ohio. Moreover, I'm curious how a VIN number for a Porsche in Ohio got used as a clone for a stolen Porsche in Arizona. Lastly is Steven's friend Tommy, who lives in Texas. I got a hold of Tommy a few months back, and Tommy was extremely friendly and was glad to hear that people are still out in the world trying to find out what happened to his friend Stephen. Tommy told me that he had contacted Stephen that last week before Stephen disappeared to find out Stephen's new address so he could send him a Christmas card. If you were someone who knew Stephen personally and want to share any memories or your thoughts on Stephen's disappearance, please contact me at aaronstoner at yahoo.com. I would love to speak with you. I have decided to increase the reward money for information that leads to the discovery of what happened to Stephen Kosher to $3,000. I am hopeful it will be enough to incentivize someone to come forward, someone who may have overheard a conversation or have some information, no matter how small, that may help connect the dots. If you have any information on the disappearance of Stephen Kosher, please contact the Henderson Police Department tip line at 702-267-5000 or email me at aaronstoner at yahoo.com. You can remain completely anonymous. Thank you so much for checking out this update on the Stephen Kosher case. If you enjoyed this content, please drop me a like and subscribe to my channel for future videos covering the Stephen Kosher case as well as other cases from time to time.